wonderful introduction, sister. Uh, a little bit about myself. So I work at uh, St. Paul University uh, for a few days a week. Uh, and as they say, there's no such thing as part-time jobs in the church, only part-time salaries. Uh, so I'm, my doctor told me last week that I'm working far too much, but that's okay. Blessed be God. Um, doing the fun things with complex university funding, a very complicated system in Ontario with federal funding and provincial funding and all these things. Because unlike in the United States, Catholic education uh, to various degrees, depending on where you are in Canada, is funded by the government. Uh, so our, our, our Catholic elementary schools are fully funded, our Catholic high schools are fully funded by the government, so you don't pay a cent to go there. Um, and then our universities receive partial funding. So we receive funding for our students, but we don't receive infrastructure funding. So I do a lot of budgets and that kind of fun stuff. Um, and I also am a canonist, and I say that just so that we know where I'm coming from uh, with this talk. Everybody comes to a talk with this, their own backgrounds and their own biases, perhaps. Uh, and so when I approach these questions, I am not a systematic theologian. Uh, hopefully I know a little bit about systematic theology, but I'm not a systematic theologian by training. So uh, the thing that I chose today is I believe, because I think like many things liturgically, we have these things that we say again and again and perhaps don't always think about exactly what we're saying, or if we do, maybe we don't always get the answers to what they mean. The use of sources in Christos Nasha Pascha is very interesting in, in what sections use what sources and how do they use them. So we'll talk uh, very briefly about that. So as far as catechesis, um, comes from the Greek katecheo, which is the instruction from the word of mouth. And something we need to remember is that catechesis is fundamentally a public proclamation. A catechesis happened when people were creating for baptism, uh, were preparing for baptism. Catechism happened when people uh, were looking to deepen their faith. So in more public contexts, uh, and we could certainly have a lecture easily on sort of the history of catechism, uh, how it happens, uh, in Ukraine especially, it's very interesting, especially through the period of the Union of Brest, where you have these big public debates happening, you know, between you know, Jesuits and Calvinists, or between Jesuits and Orthodox, and different people who are having these big, complicated uh, discussions on what is the right understanding of the faith. Uh, to say that uh, catechism is not originally a Christian idea, it's something that the Church inherited, and like all things, uh, appropriated and made its own. So, the Second Vatican Council, Christus Dominus, says that catechetical instruction, which is intended to make the faith, as illuminated by teaching, a vital, explicit, and effective force in the lives of men. Catechism is meant to give us a way to have an encounter with the living Christ. And hopefully that's what we're going to focus on today. It's great to understand these complicated theological concepts, uh, but what's more important is that it means something in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And hopefully today... Uh, there'll be a chance, I, I realize we're at a, a spirituality center as opposed to a faculty of theology, so to give an overview of what does this mean for our own journey uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, this is more just for information, but uh, you know we do have the liturgy of catechumens in the Divine Liturgy, most frequently not taken in North America, a few parishes in the Epic of Toronto, maybe in some places in the States too. Um, but generally it's skipped in most parishes because, unfortunately, most of our parishes don't really have catechumens. Uh, we don't have too many adult baptisms. Some, but not too many. Although in Ukraine, if you go to most parishes, they do take this litany. And the idea being that even if they're not catechumens here, they're somewhere. And they should be prayed for. And they should be uh, continue their preparation for baptism. And this would have been the context of where early catechesis happened. And that's why I bring it up here is because certainly in the early church, these um, baptismal statements, these creeds, were meant to be for baptism. They didn't really come for a Eucharistic center. We 
we say the creed most frequently today at the Divine Liturgy, but that doesn't emerge until about the 6th century, that in the early church, creeds are really only said at baptism or when one studies it. So as I mentioned, catechesis, which is sharing by the word of mouth, uh, was certainly public. And then in the more uh, modern era, in the aftermath of the Council of Trent, we move towards what we have uh, written catechism. So certainly this is one of the more recent versions of that, uh, but there begins to be an approach where uh, people write down catechism. So in the United States you have the very famous, you know, the Baltimore Catechism from the Council of Baltimore, which attempts to give people a reference, a reference to what they believe. And because it's a reference, they frequently take the form of questions and answers uh, until very recently. So the Roman Catechism, also called the Catechism of the Council of Trent, is one of the first versions of this. It's a response, as I mentioned, that we have these public debates happening between Catholics and non-Catholics, um, and that this provides an authoritative text of what the Catholic faith is for those who want to have a reference. And uh, if you study the history of the Ukrainian Church, this becomes a very contentious issue. Uh, if any of you have heard of one Ukrainian hierarch called Maleti Smotrytsky, a very interesting fellow. If you have a chance to read about him, I'd really recommend him. Uh, David Frick, I think, has a couple books about him from the Harvard Ukrainian uh, Research Institute. Uh, and Maleti Smotrytsky is having this crisis where he doesn't really know as many in that time, which is one of the reasons we have the Union of Brest, don't really understand what the faith is teaching about. So he goes down to Constantinople to talk to the patriarch because he wants to write one of these. He wants to write a catechism. And when he goes to Constantinople, remember that at this time, the Turks are running the show, uh, the patriarch has become a, an appointment of the Ottoman Emperor, and uh, at that time, the patriarch is, uh, is a Calvinist, basically. And Leti Smutritsky leaves that environment very dis disenchanted, doesn't really know, as an Orthodox, is very anti-Unia, and ends up in the end coming in uh, to the, the communion with the Holy See uh, and dies in that communion, a very interesting story. Um, but the Roman Catechism is, the, is divided into the Apostles' Creed, the Sacraments, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and prayer. And the Apostles' Creed is that same uh, structure that we see in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is not something uh, that is really used in our tradition, the Apostles' Creed, that is. Um, but to some extent, we'll talk about this a bit later, the creeds in themselves were something that sort of came from the West that while the Nicene Creed emerges in the East, the precedents are all drawn from the West. That the creeds, the baptismal creed as a genre, uh, is something that emerges in the Latin Church. Uh, in Ukraine, we have the uh, famous Orthodox Confession of Faith in 1640, um, written by Metropolitan Petro Mohila, who is uh, one of the great reformers of the uh, anti unia forces uh, in the period after the Union of Brest, one of the great uh, intellectual minds of medieval um, Kiev and Rus. And Metropolitan Mohila's structure, much like the Roman Catechism and much like most other catechisms until the 20th century, take this question and answer for us. So, you know, how many articles are there of the Orthodox Catholic faith? The articles of the Orthodox Catholic faith are 12 according to the creed of the first Nicaea and first Constantinople, which is the subject of today's talk in which councils everything concerning our faith up to that time had been declared, so that nothing more or less different must be believed except that which the fathers knew. Truly, however, some of these articles are clear in themselves, others contain certain mysteries in themselves from which other things are known. And hopefully today we'll discern some of those mysteries. So if we go into the modern era, uh, we have the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is the first catechism written for the entire Catholic Church since the Roman Catechism, so since the aftermath of the Council of Trent. So we're talking about a huge period of time here in between. Um, and the 1985 Synod of Bishops calls for a new catechism. <coughs> we just had a new code of canon law come in the aftermath of the Vatican Council. Uh, the Eastern Code was being prepared in 1985, and they also likewise called for a new catechism. And then to Cardinal Ratzinger, who was the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, later obviously Pope Benedict, uh, takes up this project. It follows the same structure as a book he wrote on the same topic uh, using the Apostles' Creed, but in his defense is also the structure of the Council 
of Trent's Catechism. And uh, while it first came out in 92, the official text, which we call the Editio Typica, is approved in 97. So uh, the Editio Typica is what is approved by the Holy See. So for example, for the Ukrainian Catholic Church, we already have this text in Ukrainian. Uh, as of yet, there is no English translation. Hopefully, in God's time, it will be soon. I've seen a draft, so I'm getting there, I guess. Um, but the Holy See works in seven languages. Ukrainian is not one of those seven languages, which means this cannot be the official text. It can't be received what's called the Reculitio from the Holy See. So uh, the English text is going to be that standard text, which will be approved by the Holy See. And uh, what happened in 97 is the official Latin is approved, which did, in some places, differ from the 92 text. And that could theoretically happen for ours, is the English text could have some changes, which would mean we need to go back and make those changes in the Ukrainian text to reflect the official text. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church, again, has four parts. Profession of faith, celebration of the Christian mystery, life in Christ, and Christian prayer. So it's remarkably similar in structure to the Roman Catechism, although it doesn't have the question and answer format. It's, it's much more um, descriptive, as is the same format as Christ or Pascha. Uh, so, we have the Catechism of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. There are many uh, versions of it, so you might have, I have one cover, there's another cover, I've seen one now, it's coil bound, there's that green, there's that one there, the blue one, the heart, heart bound, there's all kinds of different versions. Uh, and we can maybe ask, why do we even need a catechism for the Ukrainian Catholic Church, you know? Is that something we should worry about? Uh, and we should look back to the Second Vatican Council and see that the four characteristics of a particular church which is called more technically a church suriutis, a church of its own right, are liturgy, theology, spirituality, and canon law. And all of these arguments, our own liturgy, our own theology, our own spirituality, our own canon law, make an argument for having our own catechism that's distinct from the, that of the entire Catholic Church. That, uh, we have a distinctiveness about the Chaosian Church uh, that is not maybe reflected at all times in the, in the Western Catechism. Perhaps even the uh, adoption of the Apostles' Creed was not a very sensitive issue to those churches which don't use the Apostles' Creed in its structure. Uh, and even Canon Law says that the Synod of Bishops of the Patriarchal Church is competent to issue norms on catechetical formation. The Synod of Bishops has this role and this ability to make its own catechisms, and our Synod has taken that task. Uh, in paragraph 2, the special character of the Eastern churches is to be taken account so that biblical and liturgical emphases, as well as traditions of each church through Eurus and Petrology, and Geography, and Iconography, are highlighted in conveying catechesis. So certainly in the Christian East, we have a very different emphasis on the church fathers, our own tradition of saints, and certainly the role of iconography are very different than they are in the West, and certainly we have these wonderful plug uh, for Shiftiski Institute posters here um, that identify you know, that there are different emphases, which is not to say one is better than the other, but that we have our own, uh, our own traditions. And beyond that, John Paul II, when he promulgated the Catechism of the Catholic Church, soon to be Saint John Paul II, um, in a document called Fide Depositum, said that the catechism of the Catholic Church is not intended to replace local catechisms duly approved by ecclesiastical authorities. The Dastan bishops and episcopal conferences, especially if they've been approved by the Apostolic See. It's meant to encourage and assist in the writing of new local catechisms, which take into account situations and cultures while carefully preserving the unity of faith and fidelity to Catholic doctrine. So this is meant to encourage local catechisms, which unfortunately I think has usually the opposite effect, that you know, we say, hey, you know, we got this big one, let's just use what they have. Uh, but in fact, it's supposed to do the opposite. That then, so now the USCCCB or the Canadian CCB or different, uh, even metropolitan provinces could uh, make their own catechisms. So the basic structure of Christ our Pasch, uh, one of the Shiftiski Institute's most uh, well-known students now, former students, his Beatitude Shatislav, with his very happy having his copy of the catechism there, um, we have three sections on In Christ Our Pascha. Uh, the Faith of the Church is the first section, and this follows the basic structure of the symbol of faith, although it does at times pull in parts of the Eucharistic anaphora. Uh, 
The second part, the prayer of the church, follows more closely the Eucharistic anaphora, especially that of St. Basil, uh, because it's much more descriptive, much more say, very deep theologically. Uh, and the third part is on the life of the church. Uh, and there have already been presentations on the final two, and now we're working on that first one here. So the use of sources in the catechism, as I mentioned, is a very interesting topic because it certainly shows how the different uh, section writers, because while this is one project, like anything, like even the Bible, every writer has its own sort of um, approach to the topic. Uh, and while I'm not going to go into all the parts of the catechism here, uh, when we go through the first part, we'll see how it deals with this and how it relates to sort of the catechism as a whole. So what types of sources? Certainly scripture is the most frequently cited thing, and almost every paragraph has one or two citations from scripture, uh, sometimes from, from the Masoretic text, uh, which is the Hebrew text of the Bible, sometimes from the Septuagint, which is interesting, uh, because certainly uh, in the Christianese, historically at least, we would have used the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek text of the Old Testament, uh, and that text is actually the older text. The Hebrew text comes from a later time. It's not to say one is I mean, sort of modern scholarship. Many, especially Protestants, would say, well, it's Hebrew, so it's probably closer to the original. But uh, if you, in fact, look at some of the, the fragments from Qumran and other places, the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see actually that some of the texts which are in the Greek text actually reflect those ancient uh, variants. So at least the Greek text reflects an old textual tradition. So there may have been different versions floating around. And at times, Christ or Paz draws on that and does attempt to identify that. Uh, at other times, it clearly draws from the Masoretic text. So even when Christ or Pascha talks about how many books of the Bible there are, it does count the number in the Hebrew text. It doesn't count the number in, for example, the Slavonic Bible. Because in a church Slavonic Bible, there are more books than there are in a Greek Bible. And in a Greek Bible, there are more books than there are in a Hebrew Bible. And if we look at other Eastern churches, for example, Ethiopians have even more books than the Slavonic Bible. So the Old Testament especially has different groups of uh, books, and we call these deuterocanonicals in the Catholic tradition, or sometimes you'll see Protestants will refer to them as apocryphal books. So sometimes the Bible will say with apocrypha, or a Catholic Bible will say with deuterocanonical books. Church councils are drawn on very widely in Christ our past, especially the Second Vatican Council, uh, but also other councils, uh, church fathers, Eastern and Western, aka Latin. Um, in the East, we had many languages we're dealing with, but in the Western church, generally most of that was written in Latin, with some exceptions. Liturgical texts are especially drawn, Roman documents, and by that I mean documents of the Holy See, writings of the Holy Fathers, um, perhaps documents of different Roman diacasteries or the congregations and other texts, for example, liturgical prayer books that are not for the whole church, but, um, for example, I don't think, the Muslim Slav actually is cited a few times, or Predicta Pocunimsia, which is the student prayer book, is, is cited a few times too, uh, which gives a certain authority to these uh, privately produced books. So, in the entire catechism, uh, I didn't count the scripture because it would really skew the number. So I'll say number one is definitely scripture. You know, there are hundreds and hundreds of citations from scripture. And even in Christ or Pascha, uh, they reflect that because scripture is never in the footnotes. It's always the in-text brackets, parentheses, citations uh, to reflect just how many times it's cited. It would really make the text, you know, would be about half the page and the footnotes would be most of it. Um, but as we can see, uh, Certainly, Eastern Church Fathers are the number one category of text cited in Christ our Pascha. Um, and then Western Fathers, liturgical texts, church councils, also interestingly, the writings of Ukrainian hierarchs. For example, um, Eladion of Kiev, especially some other texts uh, from other Ukrainian churchmen are used. Uh, Eladion of Kiev was the first ethnic, um, you would say the Rusin, ethnic Kievan. Uh, who is appointed to the see as, as Metropolitan of Kiev, wrote a very famous work called The Sermon on Law and Grace, Slovo Prozakolni Blahodat, in Slovak. Um, if you've never read it, read it. It's available in English too, I think even online. You can find it on the internet from Harvard. Uh, it's an excellent reading. 
um, and then other writings, which were those prayer books and other things, as I mentioned. So how is our sources treated in part one of the Catechism? So just before we get into that, the basic structure, so you know where we're going with this. Uh, the faith of the church has these general uh, categories, these general subtitles. I should say that all translations are unofficial, so please do not quote me. Uh, I did see a draft that I was very strictly told this is for my personal use only. Um, so revelation of the most holy trinity, God's revelation and sacred tradition. So how do we know uh, what we know about the trinity? How do we even come to understand these concepts of the trinity? The persons of the trinity and the third section goes through the creator and creation, the incarnation, and the church. So that's sort of the structure in general terms uh, we're going to follow today. What's of interest is that in the catechism it takes the parts of the creed and sometimes reorders them, puts them in uh, what seems to them to be a, uh, a logical structure. In my presentation I'm going to try my best to keep the structure of the Nicene Creed, uh, which is not to say one is better than the other, I think just it, as we're going through the creed it might make better connections and to what we hear more, most frequently. So how does Christ our cost deal with the topic of councils? So certainly uh, the most fundamental number of citations are from the, what we call the seven ecumenical councils. So in the Christian East, uh, at least in the Eastern Orthodox churches as opposed to Oriental Orthodox, Assyrian churches, uh, the, the councils which are most frequently recognized as ecumenical are the first set. And those run from the 4th the, the century until the 9th century. So starting with Nicaea 1 and ending with Constantinople 2. Uh, and then those churches, at those councils after, are of less ecumenical value, perhaps we could say. Uh, at least in the opinion of uh, traditional Christian Eastern theology. Um, the Council of Florence, which now again most Orthodox, will certainly would not recognize as ecumenical, but the Catholic Church recognizes as an ecumenical council is cited many times, uh, and that's one of the interesting topics of how does our catechism appropriate different uh, categories, for example, um, things that are later developments in Catholic theology, how, do that, how does that impact onto our theology as Eastern Catholics? So sometimes you might hear, uh, dare I say, crazy things uh, that, for example, humanity vitae might not apply to Eastern Catholics, or you might hear that uh, you know, uh, the Immaculate Conception, that, that's a document that applies to Roman Catholics, doesn't really apply to us, uh, or Purgatory is another one, um, but those are all cited, cited in here, so I think that gives a certain, certainly a, a, certainly, uh, a value to those teachings uh, recognized by our Synod of Bishops. The Union of Rest, which is the agreement that brings about the Ukrainian Catholic Church, as we understand it today, the First Vatican Council, this happens in the context of the teaching of the Bishop of Rome, and the vast majority are, is the Second Vatican Council. Western Church Fathers, uh, Augustine, Irenaeus, Irenaeus is one of those Western Fathers who actually writes in Greek, uh, Jerome, Tertullian, Leo the Great, so we have all these different uh, Western Fathers, some of whom are saints, some of whom are not. A, a wide variety of Eastern Church Fathers, some of whom are much more, uh, you say, contemporary to some extent, Church Fathers. So, for example, uh, Leonidas of Byzantium is one of the more uh, modern ones. Not all of them are saints either. For example, Origen uh, is condemned as a, uh, we say each word, as a heretic at an ecumenical council, although not to say that everything he said was bad, especially because amongst his students are certainly St. Basil and St. Macrina. Uh, you can actually see an icon of, of Origen, who, who's not canonized, but with many of his children who are, uh, sorry, uh, many of his students who are canonized. Um, and uh, then certainly the, the classics, they have liberated John Chrysostom, Simeon the New Theologian, uh, Gregory is a more sort of uh, mainline saint. John Damascene, many people don't know, is the saint most frequently cited by Thomas Aquinas, the church father, uh, is John Damascene. And then Ukrainian hierarchs, you know, so Christ Arkoska has done a great job, especially in the first section, of appropriating our own theological tradition. So as I mentioned, Ilarion of Kiev, uh, who had many works writing in the 11th century, 
uh, seal of Turov, uh, Dimitro of Rostov, also called uh, Tuktal, so the different names depending on who are reading Russian books or reading Ukrainian books, uh, Metropolitan Andrei Shakitsky, and then Patriarch Yosef UK uh, are certainly all cited. Roman sources, writings of the popes, uh, the most frequently cited, the Catechism of the Catholic Church is cited eight times, and then the Eastern Code of Canon Law gets one <laughs> citation there. Other texts, as I mentioned, liturgical texts have a, a very frequent use, and that's uh, very excellent. Um, I meant to bring, I brought a few books to, uh, I don't want to say plug, but to, if you're interested in these topics, they're very good to read. And one that I left, unfortunately, on my desk in Ottawa, uh, is a companion volume to this one. This is, uh, I'll say they're by a Russian Orthodox theologian named Boris Bobrinskoy. Um, this one is The Mystery of the Church, so it's on the Christian East's understanding of what the Church is uh, from certainly an Orthodox perspective. But he has another volume called The Mystery of the Trinity, uh, which is very interesting in how it <coughs> approaches um, the Trinity in uh, the first section. It goes through Scripture and how we understand the Trinity from both the Old and New Testament. The second section goes through the Church Fathers, and the third section goes through liturgical texts, because certainly our liturgical texts in the Christian East are meant to be theological texts that we can reflect on. I even call it the dogmaticon at Vespers, that verse that if you sing it according to Irm Lohian, it takes a little while, um, uh, where we hear about you know the nature of God and that he has two natures without conviction or confusion, on these very dense theological statements that, I mean, certainly you could write a doctorate on these liturgical texts if you want, and I had some interesting courses in theology at St. Paul's where uh, we actually had an assignment where we would do things like uh, read the propers of Holy Week, and what, what do we get Christologically out of that? And it's interestingly to sit down, and not to be singing them, but to just sit down and read through these liturgical texts, and I say if you have time to do that sometime, to do that, and something like Holy Week, uh, it's very interesting. You don't always catch all of it. I, I remember the first time I read through it not in chapel, I was thinking, well, I didn't realize I'm not very nice to those Jewish people in this, these texts, but we see those different things that sort of fly right over your head uh, when we're talking about them in the chapel because you're just trying to make sure we sing it properly or different things. So if we look at part one, the faith of the church, uh, the greenish line is what we have in part one, and the orange line is... The, if we counted them all up throughout the catechism. So I call that the average. So uh, we have a stronger use of church councils uh, in there, and that's certainly because this is the most dogmatic section. So we're going to uh, pull certainly the most authoritative church documents out in this section especially. So I believe. The Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed uh, we call this creed the symbol of faith. And what do we mean when we say that? Uh, certainly, it's faith in the risen Christ, the very source of Christian life. That uh, In here, we try and identify those things that are fundamental to the Christian faith. So, for example, we hear from the Apostle Peter, Jesus of Nazareth, God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. From Acts 2. Apostle Paul also tells us, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. 1 Corinthians 15, where your faith is in vain. That the center of our faith is the risen Christ. And so the Catechism, by its name, Christ, our Pascha, points to this, this Paschal event, the death and resurrection of Christ, which is the majority of the creed, uh, as the central uh, point for the Christian faith, that Christ has trampled death by death, and by his resurrection granted life eternal. This is the faith of the apostles that the church professes in the Nicene Constantinopolitan symbol of faith. We don't usually call it that in English, but in Ukraine certainly we call it the symbol of the uh, As I mentioned before, creeds had a baptismal context in the early church, and it's not until later, around the 6th century, that they have this Eucharistic Congress. So uh, as we get into these topics, it's important for us to talk a little bit about what the early church looked like, because the early centuries of the church uh, 
go through a lot of transition. So, uh, in the early church, the first period we can see is a period of the apostolic era. So this is after Jesus' death. Uh, we have the first major debates already. You know, when we say the church, what do we call the marks of the church? We'll talk about later. It's one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Um, now, we can say, though, was there ever a time when the church was actually one? Because if we look at, uh, certainly, theologically it's one, but I mean, present here on earth, was it ever undivided? Uh, if we look at the early church, you know, St. Paul's yelling at these poor people uh, in, in the Corinthians and saying, what are you guys doing there? Uh, that there always is some kind of separation of people from the beginning of the apostolic age. And one of the first debates uh, that we have is, what is the role of Judaism? And what is our um, tradition, what is our relationship to the Jewish faith that we've inherited? And if we read the writings of Raymond E. Brown, Raymond E. Brown is a, a Roman Catholic scripture scholar. He sees three main schools of thought that are represented really by different apostles. Uh, and the first of those that he thinks uh, is characterized by the Apostle Peter, and we read about in the Acts of the Apostles, is those who saw a very close relationship to Judaism. So those who thought, for example, that uh, the law should be observed by Gentiles, meaning they can't eat pork, they should be circumcised all these different things, and we see this in the Acts. Uh, and, that would be, and these would be mixed groups of Jews and of Gentiles, because how did the faith go? The Jews go out and they, they convert to the Gentiles. So basically, Gentiles were of all three of these groups. So it, sometimes we think of, okay, there's the Gentiles, and okay, there's the Jews, but actually, it doesn't really reflect how the, the faith would have been spread, that we would have had groups of Jews and groups of Gentiles associated with them, and then another group of Jews and Gentiles here, and another group over here. Uh, so the first group would have been those who saw that the law was strictly applicable to the Gentiles. The second group, uh, which perhaps we could say is Paul's group, are those who felt that the law, I mean, it has some relevance, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be the same it was before, maybe we could say. So but the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. The Gentiles... Uh, can eat pork. Although we should say that if we look at the canons of the early church, uh, there are there's a lot of um, perhaps we could say Levitical law that maybe we don't observe today, but it's in the canons. For example, uh, Ukrainians love to eat kishka. You know, blood sausage is a favorite a favorite thing of many uh, Eastern Slavic cultures. But there is a canon at an ecumenical council that says you will not eat the blood of animals. Uh, and even Russian Orthodox old believers who are interesting because a lot of the liturgical usages that we think maybe are distinct to Eastern Catholics actually are just old usages that, say, old believers do also. They basically slaughter their animals kosherly uh, and drain the blood out. So that's something that was present in the early church, uh, at least in some areas. And then the third community would have been those who were certainly Gentile uh, and didn't really see the importance of this whole Judaism thing. And we could say that that group, for the most part, did not make it out of the apostolic era. So if we look at different communities, uh, especially as we get into Gnostic and different groups who like Jesus, you know, but this whole book of Psalms, Old Testament, was different. And there were heresies in the early church where they even saw things like there were two gods. You know, there's the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. And in the context of these debates that the Christian faith is forming. Uh, and this really isn't that important... Uh, until after the period of persecutions, because when we're getting, you know, executed, the Romans are, you know, burning us or throwing us in lava or whatever things that they're doing, uh, it's not really that important what me and that guy think, because they're coming to get us both, you know? So, you know, whoever's not my enemy is my friend, basically. Uh, and it's after 313 that these things really start to flare up, because uh, in periods of calm, and certainly even before then, uh, what do you do with those who want to, for example, who did something during those persecutions but now want to come back? How do we treat them? Uh, how do we let them come back in the church? Can they come back from the church? You know, if you sacrifice to the gods, can we take you back? Or are you, are you done? Uh, and Constantine inherits a church that uh, is having a lot of these debates with respect to the Trinity. So... What is the nature of the Trinity? What is the nature of God? For the most part, 
all the Christians, I don't want to say all of them, but for the most part, all of them, acknowledge there is one God, you know, there is one God. But the question is, what does that one and three mean? And we get all these different schools of thought and these different heresies uh, that emerge in the early church. And a lot of these relate to what do different words mean. So hypostasis is one of these words, and we'll talk about that, substantia in Latin. Um, and what we have emerging is where uh, Alexander, who is the patriarch of Alexandria, surprise, uh, very creative name, uh, has a debate with this guy named Arius. If we read our liturgical text for the Sunday of the Fathers of the First Council in Nicaea, we call Arius the new Judas, you know, uh, the new Judas who brought division to the church, the new Judas who denied the divinity of Jesus Christ, the new Judas even, you know, St. Alexander, my patron, uh, you read the life of the saint, and you're like, this guy's a saint, you know, he prayed, one of the reasons he's canonized in his life of the saint, certainly that he, he stood for the Orthodox faith, for the Nicene faith, um, I use, oh, I mean like uh, Orthodox in a broad sense here. <laughs> Love. Yeah, he um, he prayed. You know, because apparently the fathers were going to accept Arius back into communion, and Alexander knew that he was still a heretic, and so he prayed for God to not let this happen. And so, uh, how did Judas die? There's two versions of the Bible. Most people think of the hanging, but there's another version in the Acts of the Apostles. And if you read in the Acts, Judas dies by his bowels coming out. What? His bowels oh. came out. Whatever. That means. Um, and apparently, uh, Arius also died that way. So the new Judas and the old Judas died in the same, the same way through the intercession of St. Alexander's prayer. Uh, but the basic question is what is the relationship between the persons of the Trinity? And even using that word persons, I'm realizing we're using language that means something very different today than we did back then. And this conflict emerges where. Alexander is preaching on the unity of the Trinity. He's giving out these homilies, drawing a lot on Origen, who is also from Alexandria, uh, where Origen talks about the eternal generation of the Son, meaning that there, the, the Son always existed. You know, There wasn't a time when the Son was not. And Arius did not, did not buy that. Arius, in contrast, insists that these are different, you know, there's, it's not just one God, you know, and we can see that all of these are just different emphases, sort of on the same, the same thing, where we just lose that balance. Uh, and Arius says that, no, you know, if we're saying this, that we're losing the Trinity. Arius says that there has to be distinctions within the Godhead. And because of that, he says that there's an absolute focus on God's oneness, and that the Son, in Arius' understanding, is created by the Father, and the Son is changeable. Uh, the famous quote of Arius is that there was a time when the Son was not. That basically the, the Son is part of created creation. Uh, perhaps you know, could say the Ubermensch, the greatest of all that creation, the demigod, whatever you want to say, but that is different from the rest of them. Now, Constantine is inheriting this situation. He becomes sole emperor only in 324, and the ecumenical council happens in 325, so it's very quickly. Um, before that, there, were, uh, there was the Eastern and Western emperors. And a lot of this focuses on what happened in creation. Uh, because in the Greek tradition, in at least in the Greek philosophical tradition, there wasn't really this idea of what we call creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. That there was sort of this there was a school of thought where there was some kind of void, there was something, and then God just works with that sort of primordial matter. And that's where this is coming from. You know, what, what was there in the beginning? Uh, and was the sun there in the beginning? Was the spirit there in the beginning? Or was it just God? Who would we understand today as God the Father? Um, so, at the Council of Nicaea in 325, 318 fathers gather together and they make this creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, 
begotten from the Father, only begotten, that is, from the substance of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial, homoousial, with the Father, through whom all things came into being, and those on heaven and on earth, who for us humans and for our salvation came down and was incarnate and became human, suffered and rose again on the third day, ascended into the heavens, and is coming to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit. Oh, it said the Holy Spirit. We believe in it. But as for those who say, there was once when he was not, meaning the Son, and before being begotten he was not, and that he came into being from not <coughs> Or who declare that the Son of God is of another hypostasis, or usia, or alterable, or changeable, these the Catholic and Apostolic Church anathematizes. Cuts off, you know, they're, they're done, they're outside the church. So we can say that it's, it's much briefer than the creed that we use today, um, which is because this didn't really settle everything. Um, and it clearly gives a condemnation of Arius, but uh, a lot more is going to keep going on. And certainly all of this is happening in the context, you know, that we're happening within the created world, that there are political factors happening. In Egypt especially, there were these conflicts happening in the Egyptian church, and we've sure read books on this too. Uh, so, you know, what was influencing Alexander? And some say, you know, that this was all a way to concentrate power, or we won't get into any of all of that. Um, but to say that there's a, there's a lot going on here. And Arius declines in influence after the Council of Nicaea. Um, but many still do not accept Nicaea, and they do this for different reasons. One of the reasons, true, is Constantine dies in 337. He has three sons who take over, very creative names, Constantius, Constans, and Constantinus, <laughs> uh, who are not really that committed to Nicene Orthodoxy, you know? Uh, they have their own agendas. He divided the emperor into three. And different people have different oppositions to the Council of Nicaea, and certainly many of them for different reasons. So, for example, the two major f figures that we have are Athanasius, uh, who we would say is the great defender of Nicene Orthodoxy, um, and really holds to the creed as it will eventually uh, be developed. And another one, though, is Marcellus of Ankara. Now, Marcellus uh, interprets Nicaea in a monistic fashion. He's, he looks at Nicaea and sees that, that God is one and just has these sort of three faces, almost, that act in different ways, which is very different from what we understand today. Uh, and I just bring him up to show that uh, people supported Nicaea, who had very different beliefs than what we have now, and some people opposed Nicaea, who maybe had very similar beliefs to what we have now, uh, for different political reasons, or for different, uh, what they saw as being maybe the most fundamental issues of the faith. So many people still forgot, sorry, still felt that God as Agenetos, the unbegotten, was not really appropriate. So they didn't disagree. Uh, you know, Arius said that there was a time when the sun was not. They thought that was ridiculous. They didn't. I mean, they, they could agree on that, so they accepted Nicaea. Uh, but what does that mean? Is where they still disagree. And for example, one of the fundamental positions in of Athanasius, uh, sorry, of, of some of the who we call not Athanasius, the Neo Arians. So these are two different groups of the Homoousios. So those of Homoousios means of the same substance. Homoousios means of a similar substance, and the heterousios of a different substance. Um, they felt, those two, the Neo-Aryans, felt that, um, that God, God's nature is related to him having not begotten anyone. That God, the Father, is his own cause, we could say, perhaps. Um, and because of that, so they're not denying that the Son is God, but they see a different, a different relationship there, a different, you could say, different cause, which again has its roots in Greek philosophy. Um, and so they didn't really get into this whole Nicene thing. Uh, and so what happens is another council has to be called. So the difference, the real differences are between usia, or in Latin, substantia, so the substance, prosopon, 
the persons and the hypostasis. And so entering also into this is what is the Holy Spirit? We see that nice little line, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, that's great. What does that mean? Um, and Arius himself wrote almost nothing on the Holy Spirit. But then we have entering in two other groups, the Tropiki and the Macedonians. Macedonians are not people from Macedonia. They are followers of a guy named Macedonius. Um, so that, that can be confusing. Sometimes you actually see Macedonians with quotes around it to sort of distinguish. Uh, but this is followers of Macedonia. So the first group, uh, the Tropiki, uh, see the spirit as a created angel. And they even, they, call, they have scriptural, you know, God refers to ministering spirits, Hebrews 1.14. The Macedonians, uh, they saw the Spirit as sort of a way of God acting. So it's sort of a part of God, almost like, you know, I have a voice, I say something. That voice isn't different than me, you know, that's, that's part of me. Uh, so that was their basic understanding. And they look at the book of Zechariah. These things the angel says speaks within me. So basically like God says, you know, that there's an angel that speaks within me. It's like his inner voice, you know. So their approach was, how can we say that's a different person? Uh, so they in somehow subordinated that to the Son, meaning that they saw a very, there was God the Father at the top of creation, the Son below that, and even, even lower down, if it even existed at all, is the Spirit. Now, Athanasius writes on, on this topic, and Basil the Great, Basil Caesarea, and then we get the Sisters of St. Basil, uh, writes a lot about this, writes a lot on the Holy Spirit, because he's really going after this understanding. And what happens is the Council of Constantinople is called. Uh, the majority of them are pro-Nicene, but a number of Macedonian bishops do come, although they quickly see that this is not going to go their way, uh, and they walk out in protest. And we don't have the Acts from the Council of Constantinople. They've been lost. We have the canons. Um, and the first canon confirms Nicaea, and anathematizes those who reject the full and equal divinity of both the Son and the Spirit. Rejecting Eunomius and his followers, Arius and his followers, and the semi-Arians, not seminarians, semi-Arians, uh, or we call them the neo-Arians, people who follow some kind of teaching of Arius, but that is definitely distinct. They rejected modalism. Modalism is where the understanding where God is really, it's just one, one person who acts in different ways. So he acts as the Son, he acts as the Spirit. That's modalism. As well as Apollinarianism, which is God the Son. He becomes man, but he really doesn't take in, like, he's not really fully man, you know. He doesn't have a human will or anything like that. Uh, so that's Apollinarianism. They condemn those also. What about the Creed? Uh, now we have to, we always call it the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. But, in what we actually have from the Council, what has survived to today, which is not to say it didn't exist then, but just what we still have today, the Creed is not in there. Uh, what we do have is that the Acts of the Council of Chalcedon in 451, which will be the next ecumenical council, we are told that the Archdeacon of Constantinople read a creed called the Confession of Faith of Constantinople, uh, which is that creed that we read today. Uh, so this is our earliest, we call an extant record, our earliest text that we still have today. And that is, probably will sound familiar, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten by the Father before all ages. Light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, Consubstantial with the Father, through whom all things came into being, who for us human beings and for our salvation came down from the heavens and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became human and was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and ascended into the heavens and is seated at the right hand of the Father and is coming again with glory to judge the living and the dead of whose kingship there will be no end. I am the Holy Spirit, the Lord and life giver, who proceeds from the Father, who is co-worshipped and co-glorified with the Father and the Son, who has spoken through the prophets, and in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we wait for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
as a sidebar, the fact that we didn't actually have the acts of the Council of Constantinople, you know, the filioque, you know what the Orthodox right. say, say, well, they added it. You know, there was a time in church history where the Latins actually said, you dropped it. You know, that, that was sort of one of the positions that existed. Uh, they said, you know, the creed had the filioque, and we couldn't really disprove it, because we didn't have the original, the original text. Um, so that's the basic text upon which we're going to focus. Oh,